I'm here uh, with Ben Aldrich and with Steve Martinelli. Uh, thanks for both of you for coming on. So let's talk about the Internet Archive. Is that cool? All right, let's do it. No. All right. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Ben was actually on the episode with the Internet Archive. So, you know, very special guest. Um, yeah. I think, I think yeah. the episode's technically titled World's Strangest Librarian. I think that's the, uh, the official title of the episode. But, uh, okay. but yeah, it's about the Internet Archive. That's good. Uh, so speaking of the Internet Archive, let me just explain really quick what it is. Uh, the Internet Archive allows the public to upload and download digital material to its data cluster, uh, but the bulk of its data is collected automatically by its web crawler. So users can send stuff to it in order to back up the Internet, and then there's a web, a web crawler that is just automatically just passively crawling the Internet as a whole, and then literally... Uh, true to its name just archiving the internet and it's everything right Fen? it's i mean it's books it's, it's lots of stuff video games yeah. it's, it's whatever M most folks are probably most familiar with the internet archive from like the Wayback machine like that's probably yeah. the thing you've touched mm -hmm. if you've touched the internet archive um and it, i mean I, I know that's been great like i've i've looked up old websites all the time like what did this used to look like in 2004 um and you can pull up you know the archived version of that website from that time like there are some websites that only exist because we have the internet archive now um, and, but, but yeah, they, they store everything, including, uh, I, I guess video games, uh, turns out, I know people's like movies and stuff. You can upload stuff. There's some, there's some amount of curation cause they also store physical books as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, both like rare and not cause the main things are digitizing everything. Um, so they'll have a real artifact yeah. that then gets digitized that they store, um, and if you listen to the episode, we talk a lot about data provenance and like who who decides what we back up and also how do we know where it came from? And is it real? Because like you could put up a fake website and then archive it. And then like, how do we know that was a real website ever that existed? Right. Um, so like there's lots of interesting uh, angles that you should listen to the actual trace right episode for. But um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, just so that people know, this is not something that was built five years ago. This is one of the first websites on the internet back in 1996. <laughs> okay, so, it's older than 1996, but yes, it's it's been around a while. Sure, uh, but but <laughs> but but, it, uh, but the actual public version of the of the Wayback Machine is one that came out in 2001. So that's the one that yeah. I think that most people are familiar with, like you were mm -hmm. saying. There, there wasn't a lot to back up back then, 1996. <laughs> no, yeah, it was there was the four websites and. Uh, all those bulletin boards. Um, and so, Steve, you know, you'll probably like this. Is that the stack that it was that it was written on is HTML, of course. Uh, of course, you 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 also have CSS, JavaScript, Java, and then Python. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Librarians and data people using Python. Who would have yeah. thought? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Next thing you know, you're going to tell me that's popular with data scientists or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So how would you back up something like this? Like, I mean, if you were to build, I mean, I mean, like that, of course, today, that the principles carefully. are different, but how would you, oh, oh, you would back it up carefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On many, many uh, external hard drives, like I used to do back. Yeah, back sure, in just a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of Western digital drives uh, hooked up to my computer via USB. Yes. With um, a bicycle carrier, just, you know, dropping hmm. hard drives back and forth between buildings. Yeah. Well, That's I mean, they do that. have, theirs is all, if, if I remember correctly, theirs is all on-prem. Like, they actually own the building of the data centers, all the equipment, um, which makes sense. Like, they have a very strong interest in both protecting that data and knowing where it comes from and where it lives and, like, who has access to it uh, is, is a big concern for archival, right? Like, archival interests are a little bit different than just big data storage. Um talk to librarians about archival it's always very interesting uh because like they don't just care about oh we want the data to be there but they need the data to be there understand the metadata about it where it came from make sure it stays in good condition like mm. all of that stuff and they have to care about like bit rot and and all sorts of things uh, especially if you're storing data since 1996 right interesting yeah um so really quick, let me just show let me just show you uh, what the Wayback Machine looks like. Let's 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 just do a visual. So here, this is what yeah, it looks no, like. mostly looks the same. I think they uh, it probably uses nicer HTML. Um, I'm gonna guess it's now a responsive design as opposed to whatever it used to be. <laughs> let me see uh, I think there's there's more buttons on the screen. It used to just be the Wayback Machine, like that bit at the top and the donate. I'm pretty sure. Let's see um, yeah, it used to just be there. like a single bar in the middle. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, just like, like a like Google homepage, you mean? It was just like yeah, yeah, the yeah. search bar? Ooh, ooh, let's check out Equinix in the early 2000s. Yeah. Which, ooh, that'll be which good. 2000, 2005. Okay, 2005. Two. Busy. 2005 was a busy year. That's why I picked it. Okay. Uh, give, give me a date range. Let's go. Uh, do have, what do we got in August? Oh. January 1st? First one. August? Yeah. Jan- January 1st. Let's... January, August 1st. First of the year. Let's see what this snapshot February 30th. Like. Quick. <laughs> Was Ruffle, let's see what's happening here. Look at that. IBX, the home of the internet. Look at that. Oh, this is it. Oh, this was the page. Okay. Ooh, look Good. at our logo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's sick. That is nice. wild. Oh, man. That is such a 2000s website. <laughs> look at all those tables. Oh, it's beautiful. The only thing that would make this more like 1996 or 2001 is if there was a like marquee going across like, you know. Well, well, that's like, that's a little 1995 for 2005. Yeah. We were a decade later. We've got tables. We're aligning stuff. You know, let's What's see. What's the earliest though that we've got? Go to the earliest copy we have. Oh no, I'm denied. Let's see. Let's go back. Access to... denied. Let's see. Let's we need, go back. We here. need a little of a little construction guy with a shovel and a yield yeah. sign. Says like website under construction. Under construction. Please bear right. with us. March first, twenty twenty. Mar- uh, March first of, of two thousand is the earliest. That's beautiful. Oh man. So let's see what this. Although I mean, we're getting to the early bits of the company at that point, right? I think it was two thousand one. It was. I think publicly true. Ooh, a bunch of broken images. <laughs> I'm. Yeah. I'm expect. I'm expecting to see Clippy pop out any minute. I was going to say one thing I, I always um, appreciated was like just how much um, since S3 was so, I guess, I don't know if it's first to market, but very uh, kind of caught a lot of uh, attention. Um, it, it ended up creating so many protocols for like how people get and retrieve objects in I, S3. Through I think that was the big S3. deal about S3 was they were the first like API accessible. Yeah store like because there was dropbox there was all this other stuff before it to like store your files but s3 could be like built into your your infrastructure yeah (laughs) wait your cloud has a has a has a a object store service great is there an s3 compatible api okay (laughs) now we can talk (laughs) now we can talk yeah uh so to answer your question steve uh, i have a 321 backup uh which for those who don't know uh you need three fours of backup Two of them to be on site and then one to be off site. So that's basically how I do it. My one, my, my two on sites are my laptop, of course, and then my external hard drive. And then, of course, I just have, you know, just some like cloud storage uh, on the other side, but they're all eight terabytes. So it's because I do a lot of video stuff. So there's a lot of data there. Uh, but I use this software. It's called, um, it's called like, it, it's called something like Carbon Copy Cleaner or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it, it basically just duplicates your two drives, makes sh- it makes sure, sure that there's our, a our sync was too complicated. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say when's, when's, when does Arsync get in here? When's uh, when's Arsync on a cron job? That I I mean I don't want to tell you which job it was I was working where our backup was Arsync on a cron job, because uh, you will lose faith in important institutions. <laughs> well, I mean, the first when you're in a company, Arsync was pretty funny. Um, it was mostly when I was. Um, just fiddling around with containers and trying to copy things between like local drive and, and the container itself. And there was like yeah. an rsync kind of shim or version of it to copy the files between the two. There was a, there was a place I worked where until we got there and actually did proper actual backup with like rotations so that we weren't storing our backups on site. And so that we had the ability to restore historic data, not just uh, the last time it was there. Um, was yeah it was our syncing to an external drive that the network admin would swap each day and bring the other one home oh wow that's so the offsite was wherever the network admin lived uh that was his job title network administrator Uh, yeah that was also networked with a bunch of dumb switches just interconnected so that was the level of network administration we had uh in that office before a bunch of us got there and we're like oh no this is terrifying we need to make this much better (laughs) That's uh, that's some that's some good hit by bus. Uh, it was it was terrifying. Like the, the amount of like single points of failure was was yeah. horrifying. Sp- <laughs> speaking of those single points of failure, uh, so just to give people a context of of how many pages are involved, uh, even when it launched, 
uh, it had uh, that the web archive had scraped over 10 billion pages just when it's launched. Uh, so that was 25 years ago. And so, uh, you know, there's just a lot, there's just a lot of data that's getting backed up every day, every, every minute, every hour. Yeah. This has, this is whole, uh, and Fen, uh, you, you yeah. actually were talking to me about this too. How, uh, you know, because you mentioned about this. Yes. In, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the so episode. That's, that's one of the big things. So things you didn't know about the internet archive, uh, is it is a library. Um, there's like, you can access lots of documents there, including books, uh, that they were lending out. Mm. So, so big deal, uh, pandemic time happens. There's now a lawsuit and it's ongoing, but pandemic time happens and the internet archive says like, Hey, this is kind of an unprecedented time. People need books more than ever and can't get access to where they're going. Uh, they're, they're limited by law that if they have one copy of the book, they can lend out one copy of the book, even though it's digital. So uh, they lifted the limits during the pandemic, the early pandemic times and said, hey, people can take out as many copies as needed. That way, like if 10 people want to access this digital document, all 10 people can look at this digital document because artificial scarcity is for nerds um, and uh, and and losers. And anyway, the uh, so publishers didn't like this. Turns out uh, publishers really want to get paid every time a book is glanced at by roaming eyes and so um several publishers four or five big publishers like Har the ones you think of harper collins like all the big big names in publishing random house have been suing the internet archive over 127 titles that they lent out during this time uh saying that they infringed copyright during this time by by creating derivative works and then and then giving them away um so they've lost that lawsuit in the lower courts. And like, I believe the copyright infringement is up to like, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but it's something like tens of thousands of dollars per act of infringement, which like if the publishers sued for the maximum, they will put the internet archive out of business. It's too much money. It's like $6 billion or something stupid. Um, like, and it's to the tune that like 300, 300 authors, how many authors have, uh, written this thing let me see uh it's at the end of this article hmm. um so they, they've appealed the courts they lost the lower court decision the lower courts have said it is copyright infringement um it's it counts as creating derivative works they're no longer able to do that um but yeah as so as september last year hundreds of authors including neil gaiman naomi klein Cory doctorow uh, as well as folks like tom morello daniel ellsberg and lily wachowski signed uh, an open letter in support of the internet archive asking the publishers to withdraw their lawsuit hmm. um but the publishers um smell that wonderful green blood in the water so and one and one more chart that that i'll show this gives you a scope of how much data is back there that you know that when people are signing just to keep this this website up, there's over 700 terabytes of data that they backed up, and so you know people are fighting for this thing to stay up. And, and the, this is just way back machine going. growth, right? So this is just internet itself. Mm. Yeah, um, that's not counting the amount of like, like I said, I think you mentioned that they had a fire in like 2013 as well, and they talk about yeah. losing like they talk about losing like irrecoverable documents. Like there are one of a kind things that exist at the Internet Archive. Like there is an incredible wealth of information and history and like whole movies and film footage and books that are one of a kind and like all these things that people have decided to save. Um, that was part of the was supposed to be part of the episode, but we couldn't put it in for reasons um about some of this as well this like really rare footage that people found through like d digging through like oh this got sent in and it's like this archive of i can't i i wish my brain were not just full of holes and so that it all went out because it's a really interesting story um, but i was counting on us publishing it so that i could remember it as opposed to having to remember it myself um but it was uh it was like it had to do with information and families during um world war ii with the japanese internment camps in the united states um and like this f footage that doesn't exist anywhere else right like like someone had this like film footage that then has created documentaries and all these other things so um yeah it's a big deal it would be a big loss if uh big publishing uh wins this suit it's a big precedent for what they can sue for for libraries and like lending out information as well as uh, a huge loss if the Internet Archive can't recover financially from from that. It would yeah. be a, a massive loss to us 
as humans on the earth. Yeah. And I mean, you actually brought up a pretty good point. It's like during the We're talking episode, like, like collapse of the library of Alexandria amounts of data loss. If the internet archive goes under. Well, like what, like, so what scares me is like that I'll have a different internet than like my nieces and, and, and my nephews will have. So like that point, it's almost like that when you refer back to something that happened 20 years ago, like they're seeing almost like a different, like a sort of like revisionist history. So that's where things get really scary because as you mentioned in the episode, it's like when things are physical, whether it's a building or something, you can't change history. You can't like take down the building and then rebuild it. But if it's a website, you can just press delete, you know, just press delete a few times, upload a new picture and yeah. you've changed history. And so that gets kind of scary. And pretty soon the only way you'll be able to show people what the old internet was like is going to spacejam.com slash 1996. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love how that's still up. Yeah. They, um, I just I just went to it to see if it was there and they replaced it for the new movie that came out, but they have a link to go back to the old one. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, so Fen, if you remember the link, I'll throw it into the show notes below in the video description. And for those uh, who are watching, be sure to subscribe. And uh, any last words, Steve or Fen, before we wrap up? I wasn't up? prepared for my last words. Any <laughs> final notes before we sign off? Hold my oh, beer. God. Are those good last words? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, sorry uh no i support your local libraries uh and the internet archive and uh you know i think preserving data and lending out books for free to people is a good thing that we should do and i have to start oh steve what's that and only use s3 compatible apis <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and and like yeah if you want to store stuff uh you know on-prem and colo is good enough for the internet archive it's, it's worth considering when you're archiving lots of important data. Um, maybe some company that has like lots of colors all over the world and like the ability to use cloud compatible APIs to like set up other stuff and interconnect with your clouds. Like it could be a really good, yeah, good place Just to check out. Give it a good, give it a quick Google search. See if there's it's, any company. It's, Equ it's Equinix. You should, you should check us out if that's a thing you need to do. <laughs> uh, so if you haven't listened to trace route the show, go over to origins.dev and you can find out more about Traceroute, the podcast. You'll hear Fen and uh, you know a few other guests uh, talking about all cool stuff within the tech world and beyond. So uh, be sure to, 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 get, to give them a listen as well as to subscribe to this channel here. And then uh, my thanks to Stephen Fen for showing up on this episode. This was, yeah. this was a fun chat. And subscribe to Traceroute because season three is going to come out soon too. It's yes. Good. Give it a couple of weeks. It'll be coming out. Yeah. We got to record it first. <laughs> all, all right. right. See cool. you all. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.